Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Now towards the end of the 1980s and maybe even the early 1990s, it had kind of become clear to us that our 8-bit systems were starting to show their age. You'd still be getting great games and arcade conversions, but it was clear the hardware was really starting to struggle. But by now 16-bit systems were starting to come onto the market and we'd get the odd glimpse of games in magazines. You'd get screenshots in these adverts and stuff and you kind of had an idea of what was to come. And it was this next generation of computers that was going to be the biggest single leap in computing, graphics and audio design that I'd ever seen. And I think it will remain that way. But today we're here just to talk about one single game. One single game that was an absolute landmark of graphics and audio for the time. A game that would leave your 8-bit owning friends absolutely astounded and even your 16-bit console owning friends envious. But because this game was released on so many different formats we can kind of see what we came from to what we came to. The game of course was Shadow of the Beast, and this came out on a bunch of different systems. 8-bit systems, 16-bit systems, and there's even a 32-bit release on the FM Towns. But let's take a look at that giant graphical leap. This was the release on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. The game is kind of a Kung Fu Master clone, and if you were playing this on the 48k Sinclair ZX Spectrum as we're seeing here, I don't think you even got sound. The graphics are mainly monochrome yellow and black, or purple and black, blue and black, but that's kind of as far as it goes. But as primitive as it looks, it is actually quite a good game, it does actually play fairly well. The game also works with 128k spectrums as well. The advantage of this is you get background music and I don't think there's any multi-load on the different levels, you didn't have to load each level in each time. But just take a moment to look at the graphics, look at the graphics and listen to the music. This was what we were coming from, from the Sinclair ZX Spectrum to the Commodore Amiga. This game was released in 1989, and I can guarantee you if you saw this game in 1989 your jaw would have pretty much hit the floor. Absolutely astonishing graphics and the music that this game had, unbelievable. Coming from the beeps and the boops of the Sinclair Spectrum to the orchestral soundtrack of the Commodore Amiga, the ability to sample sound effects, it really was a leap of what seemed like at least two generations. The game itself was actually quite clunky to play, really not that much fun and probably had quite a lot of loading as well. That really didn't matter, it was the, it was the audio and visual experience of seeing this game. Just trying to get a bit further to see something new. But today we're going to take a look at this game, look at a few different versions of it, as well as a fan made remake that I've tailored into the game that I've always wanted to play. Whilst the second Shadow of the Beast game was probably the first game I saw on the Commodore Amiga, it was that first game that was far more graphically impressive. And I think we got a copy of this game, I think it came on a stack of copy discs or Bloggo's Power as it was known back in the day. If you don't know what Bloggo's Power is, it refers to this really cheesy advert. This was in every magazine in the 80s and 90s. Some guy selling dodgy games at a market and one of them is called Bloggo's Power. So that's where that comes from if you ever see a reference to it online. So along with that Amiga version, we're going to look at a few other releases on other systems as well. Just ones that I find kind of interesting. The first is the release on the Atari Lynx, and this is a fantastic release for this little handheld. In many ways this is just as impressive as that Amiga version, considering the hardware it's trying to run on. And I'd say the gameplay is a little bit tighter than the Amiga version, it's a bit more responsive and a little bit more fair as well. Next up is Super Shadow of the Beast for the Super Nintendo. This never actually saw a commercial release, and that's a good thing. This is a bit of a stinker this version. It's really not very polished at all. Really bad sound and the graphics could have been much improved I think. And last up there's that Sega Master System version, a fantastic little 8-bit reproduction of the game and it's got its own little extra bits and pieces that you don't see in other versions so for that reason I think it's worth including. It's definitely an interesting little version of the game. So why even bother looking at different versions of this game? Well nowadays everything looks the same, you can play the same game on different generations of consoles, it doesn't look that different. I always use Skyrim as an example, look at that on the Switch, Xbox 360, Playstation 3, 4, 5, whatever. It doesn't look that different does it? Back in the day everything looked different. Here we're going to take a look at the same game and just see how these versions are different from each other. Now anyone who's played this game before on the Commodore Amiga knows that the first thing you have to do is head left to the tree. There's a few little obstacles on the way, there's rocks, there's bats, there's man traps, but that's about it. 
And if you head too far left in the Commodore Amiga version, you eventually reach this tree. You can't get past it, and if you walk right up close to it, you fall into a hole and die. With the Atari Lynx version, we get differences right from the start of the game. Take a few steps right, and there's this guy trying to shoot a cannon. Hit the cannon, knock the guy out, take the gun. Now you do get the gun in the Amiga version of the game as well, but it's not till right near the end of the game, so picking it up this early really does feel a bit strange. Head left as before, and this time you get a load of bats in the tree, and you cannot kill these guys unless you use the gun. Don't use the gun though, because you'll need it for later. Head left like you did in the other version of the game, you got three man traps, but this time you do have the tree at the far end, but you've got a load of spikes in the ground. Now why is this different? It's things like this that I find bizarrely interesting. All these uh, different versions of the game. Why were these choices made? It's the same game, why were things changed? On the Super Nintendo version, head left and you get the bats in the trees just like in the Lynx version. The difference here though is you can take them out, and this rather rushed port does have this kind of rubbish thing where you can kind of just jump kick your way through the game and uh, you won't actually do too badly. <laughs> but head to the far left and this time there's no tree but there are spikes in the ground. With that Sega Master System version it is cut down on graphics a little bit but head left as you would in the other versions but this time it is a little bit different. You've got to go past the tree and you've got to pick up the key to get in the tree. And that's hiding in a pile of rocks, and this is the only version that has that in it. Again, why is it different? No one knows. There's no holes or spikes on the far left, you just can't go any further. Whichever version of the game you play, you've got to get into the tree to go to the next level. The layouts of these four versions is different in the second level as well. The goal remains the same though, you've got to get two keys, one to escape this level and one that you'll need later on in the game. And don't forget that second key, otherwise you're going to be really unhappy later on. What makes this game so tough, particularly the Amiga version, is you only get 12 hit points. You can pick up potions to bring it back up, but 12 is all you get. And another thing that makes this game difficult is the timing of the attacks. Hitting the enemy and taking the enemy out before they hit you, it's sub-second timing. So you really have got to get that timing down just right. And this is probably a good point to show where the Master System version differs. If you come to the same area on the Master System version, you get the concept of potions. And it's not just health, there's a bunch of potions in this game. Some help you, some hinder you. How do you know what does what? You don't. You have to use it to find out. At least you did pre-internet in the 1980s. This one gives you a long jump so you can jump over and get an extra life. The Atari Lynx version of this game actually plays fairly well. I think it's probably one of the best playing versions of the game. It just seems a little bit more suited to this system. It's nice and responsive as well, which uh, some of the other versions aren't. They're a little bit sluggish to play. And we get some differences here as well. The layout's different. You get moving platforms and ropes and stuff to swing on. Different enemies as well. And it's a must pick up game for the Atari Lynx. And of course there's Super Shadow of the Beast on the Super Nintendo. And there's nothing super about this version of the game. Thankfully never released, and I don't think it would have got much of a great reception even if it did get released. It definitely feels a little bit unfinished, a little bit unpolished, it needs a bit more work. But we're on to our first two bosses. The only real difference on this fight is the Super Nintendo version has a teleporter behind the boss. I don't know why that is, it's not in that location on the Amiga version. But you've got to defeat this boss in all versions to be able to take on the second boss. There's a unique boss on the Atari Lynx version for the next part, and I don't know what it is about this game, Shadow of the Beast, but there's so many different versions of this game, and they've each got their own little unique bits and pieces in it. True, there's other games like that that have that kind of thing, but I don't think there's another game that has so many differences in it. we got to make sure we've already picked up the key to get out of this level already, and this kind of relates to the Master System version as well. There's items that are red herrings that don't do anything. There's six keys in the game, I think there's a square white key, round green key. Some of them have no use whatsoever. And you've got to find out which ones open which doors. And if you accidentally select the wrong key for the wrong door, that's it, your key's gone, your game's over. You've got no way to get it back, you have to start the game entirely from the start. That's kind of how games were in the 1980s. Next, we've got to pick up that second key, and it is pretty much in the same place for all these versions, but of course there's more differences to come. On the Amiga version, you need to head up a ladder, head left, and you'll find a switch with Don't Touch written on it. You need to hit this, and this disables a force field that's later on in the level. 
This protects a potion you need to pick up that's going to let you beat the last boss in the level. And it's the same kind of thing for the Atari Lynx version as well. More changes in the Master System version, it does still disable the force field, but it does not contain the power punch potion that you get in the Amiga version. Here the object that it guards is a green key, and this green key has no use whatsoever. So in the Master System version you don't even need to touch the switch. And Super Nintendo, which has been really disappointing so far, does it do something unique there as well? It does. It burns you. And that's all it does. Thankfully I'm playing this rubbish game through with cheats on, so I don't need to worry about it. As we head up to get the second key, the SNES version and the Lynx version have an extra puzzle. You've got to pick up this gear to fix this machine to repair a lift to take you up. The torch is also up there on the Lynx version as well, and you pick up that much later in the game on the Amiga. And whilst the layout is a bit different, you can find the key at the end of the corridor on all these four versions. There's also another curious item on the Sega Master System version here. This is the book and it teleports you back to the start of the level and refuels all your health. So it's basically the same as an extra life, it doesn't tell you what it does. Use it and find out. For the longest time this was about the furthest I could get on the Commodore Amiga release. But I eventually learned a few patterns, you learn what enemies are going to appear where, and you can kind of plan for it. But for a lot of this game you are just nudging forward, really pixel by pixel, just trying to not get hit by something that comes on screen that you don't expect. The Super Nintendo and the Lynx versions have a few surprises as we get deeper into this level, but it's kind of basic stuff. Find a switch that moves a platform that lets you get to another ledge. After disabling the force field earlier on in the level, we can go and get the power punch potion, and we need this to defeat the boss at the end of the level. On the Master System version you pick up your first white potion, and this one is pretty much essential to complete the game. It basically makes you invincible for 20 seconds and you need this because the game has pretty much a game breaking bug where if you don't use this potion your chance of beating this game is pretty much zero. So let's hold on to that for now. You do still get the power punch potion in the Super Nintendo version as well and it is controlled by a switch but it is a different switch and the potion's in a slightly different location where you've got to cross two platforms and you can pick it up. It's the same kind of situation in the Lynx version as well. Activate a switch to activate two moving platforms so you can go and get the potion. But the Atari Lynx version of this game holds up so well, it's so much more responsive and whilst the Amiga version does obviously have the best graphics and the best sound, this one is so much more responsive. It's so much more playable because of that, it's that simple, it's, it's more responsive, it plays better. This is by far the biggest level in the game, but we finally got our two keys so we're ready to get out of here and take on the boss. With the Master System you get a boss that appears much later in the game in the Amiga version. No idea why they mixed it up. But after this we use the first of our two keys to get into the well to escape back to the surface. And you better be really careful on that Master System version that you select the right key when you're right in front of the door. If you select the wrong key or the wrong item or you're too far away from the door, the item disappears and that's it, you're stuck. Start again. As we return to the surface on that Commodore Amiga version, it's probably a good time to have another talk about the graphics. How incredible these graphics were for 1989. And not just the graphics, this game has got parallax scrolling and for the uninitiated, basically what that means is Different levels of the background and foreground move at different speeds and it gives the game a bit of depth. And kind of common with the Commodore Amiga is the amount of parallax scrolling. Loads of games tried this and it was always how many levels of parallax scrolling has it got. And it got out of hand with games like Lionheart and stuff later on in the uh, Amiga's life. Each trying to do parallax scrolling, more layers, do more with the Amiga. But it was always perfected in this game. When you come out of the well at this point in the game, you're basically right back at the start. And most people who played this game for the first time would just simply head right to the castle where we're heading now. And that is not the way to go, um, because you haven't got the key which you need later on in the game. If you just head right from the start, forget it, you're not going to get anywhere. But we have picked it up so we can head through this kind of gauntlet as we head on our way to the castle, try and get a few more health points, and we've also got to pick up the torch which is outside the castle. 
you need to pick up the torch to be able to see inside the castle. Remember we already picked that up on the Atari Lynx version back on level 2. Whilst I love the Master System version for all of its faults, I do think this runs a little bit too fast. It's a little bit too tricky unless you know exactly where everything's going to come from. But the Master System does have a few more surprises at this point in the game. First of all is you find a coin in a pile of rocks. Take this back to the well at the start of the game, throw it back in and you'll get an extra life. The game really starts messing around with you now with potions as well. You get the red one that gives you two extra hit points, the green ones they give you a few extra ones, but there's also bad potions like I said and the first one will make you weaker, I think that makes you lose two hit points at a time instead of one. So leave that one behind. There's also another bad potion here that takes three points of health, leave them both. We do find the torch at this point in the game as well and you need that to be able to see in the castle. If you go in the castle without the torch the level's completely black and you won't be able to see anything. One thing I really like about the Master System version is it kind of takes liberty with the Amiga version. On the Amiga version when you approach the castle you run past this statue. It's just something in the background that looks a bit interesting but doesn't really do anything. In the Master System version they kind of made him into a character to progress the story. You gotta head into the castle and get a dragon's egg for him. On the Super Nintendo version you pick up the gun and the torch right at the start of the game as well. Really sort of ruins any sort of searching around and difficulty because you can shoot the gun straight away. And that makes getting through this part of the game on the Super Nintendo version so much easier than the Amiga. We do have some of the Super Nintendo music playing now as well and it's nowhere near as good as the Amiga. I don't know how they got this version so wrong. The graphics are far too colourful in my opinion for this game. It should have a bit of a dark and eerie atmosphere. It looks far too cartoony and bright and the music is just nowhere near as good. But this console could, you know, make great fighting games, things like Street Fighter 2 that the Commodore Amiga had no chance of getting anywhere near. How is this version this bad? But we've got to head to the castle, we've already got the torch so all we need to do is go in the castle door. The Atari Lynx console was also released in 1989. And by then I think we just about got the Nintendo Game Boy, so seeing something like this, being able to carry a portable handheld with you in colour, it was the future, if it didn't take 6 AA batteries and eat through them in no time. This game's a great technical achievement though and really shows off the power of the Atari Lynx. We finally made it to the castle, we've got inside, we've got the torch so the place is all lit up and so we can see what we're doing. And this is the furthest I ever got on the Commodore Amiga, playing the Commodore Amiga version legit, no save states, the actual hardware, this is as far as I got. And the difficulty at this point in the game goes absolutely nuts, I find this incredibly difficult. You've hardly got any health left after you run to the castle and it's a while before you get any more. There's also this part where I swear you can't get past this enemy without getting hit. I've tried it time and time again, there just seems to be no way to get past it. So you've got to eat a hit and carry on. With the Lynx and the SNES version you have this run through a bunch of barrels and this kind of reminds me of Donkey Kong a little bit. With the metal barrels you can't hit these, you've got to go down the ladder to avoid them. The Master System version does get a bit unfair here, there are a few blind jumps where if you jump in the wrong position you die, you fall on some spikes and the spikes don't take away health, they instantly kill you so you've got to be really careful. But you can't be really careful if you don't see these hazards coming through the game, it's just blind luck first of all. Thankfully there's only a couple of bits in the game like this, so you can either position yourself so you fall between the two spikes here, or if you save that long jump potion from the second level you can use it here and clear them both. There's more dodgy items for the Sega Master System at this point in the game and here you come across the magic wand. Now naturally the first time you come across this in the game you're going to pick it up, it's probably something that's going to help you. Of course not. Pick it up and use it and it's dark magic, it makes the level dark again. So you can't do anything until you kill yourself and start over. They probably wouldn't get away with stuff like this these days. On all four of these versions you've got to head to the top floor of the castle, you've got to head there to get the wrench. And you need the wrench to be able to disable a machine later on that has another force field. 
Thankfully, we can finally pick up a few extra hit points here as well. Another potion on the Sega Master System version, and it looks very similar to the health potion, but it is a little bit darker. Does this one help you? No, of course not. This one reverses your controls. Thankfully, it's only for sort of 20 seconds or so. Because the Atari Lynx version is that much more responsive, this area in the game is nowhere near as bad as the other releases. And there's a few unique things to the layout as well. But we've got to keep heading down to the bottom of the map, we've got to pick up the gun, and we need the gun to beat the boss. Remember, half of these versions we've already got the gun, for some strange reason, but we need to get it on the Master System and the Amiga version. Right at the bottom of the map we finally pick up the gun, and this makes an incredibly difficult game only slightly easier. In all versions of the game you need the gun to be able to take out the boss, so this is not an optional item, you have to pick it up if you want to get out of this level. And we've picked it up on the Master System version as well. And just to show you how the Sega release of this game is basically held together with sticky tape and glue, the next step is we need to use our wrench on the machine to disable the force field so we can pass. Just like we did in level 2, nice and straightforward. But this is buggy as hell. You walk up to it, you're not even that close to it, and for no reason whatsoever, you die. Thankfully, try and again, you can use the wrench and get past, but really buggy. We're almost at the end of this level now, we just need to take out the last boss. There is a potion we need to pick up on the Sega Master System version. This lets you jump higher, and it is essential, you cannot complete the game without it. So this one is our first potion in a while that actually does help you. This boss is thankfully fairly straightforward. Just watch out for the bullets, jump over and use the gun. And it's pretty much the same thing in the Atari Lynx version as well. But you do have limited bullets in the Lynx version, so you've got to pick up extras. I don't know what happened to the Nintendo version of this game. It's like they got to this point in the game and they just gave up. You can't even really tell when you're hitting this boss or not. Just keep wailing away and eventually you'll get it down. With the Sega Master System version, I really like what they've done on this boss. On the Amiga version, in the background there's a couple of figures. And the figure on the right actually is the boss. So they've taken some graphics from the Amiga version that aren't used in any other version and they've used them for the boss. And I think that's quite cool. So you've got to have an eye for these things. You can't take out this boss without using that potion that you recently picked up. Use the potion and you can jump high and do damage but it's another little change on this version that makes the game unique. On the Amiga version, when you defeat the boss, you can finally move to the next level. And as you approach the door, you put on this jetpack and you're all ready to go. And of course the Sega Master System version's got its little foibles here as well. You have to pick up a key in this level to open the door. And if you open the door without putting the jetpack on first, you actually lose a bunch of health. But the first time through this game, you're never going to know that's a jetpack, you're never going to know that this is the point you've got to use it. Trial and error. We're almost at the end of the game now. Just this level and one more to go. This level's actually missing entirely from the Atari Lynx version, probably down to cartridge space and cost, but it's not that important. What this level is though is extremely hard, there's lots of stuff to avoid, you've got to take it very very slowly and build up your health for the last level. The Super Nintendo version of this level is entirely auto-scrolling, so you can't choose how fast you move, and there's way too much stuff on the screen, so you're going to get hit a lot as well. The Sega system is just as difficult as the other ones. Don't stop shooting and move up and down as much as possible to cover as much of the screen. Hopefully you'll hit something. There's a couple of items here, there's some health pickups, there's another white potion which is the invincibility potion, so we've got two now. And of course this black potion or clear potion. What does it do? Nothing. There's one more item you've got to pick up as well, and that is the dragon's egg that we were asked to fetch. And finally we can go on to the boss. This one's fairly straightforward though, just keep avoiding the stuff and keep shooting. But after the boss we finally finished this level. Well you have if you brought that key, the key you went to pick up way back in level 2, the whole reason for going into that level 2, the tree level, 
getting through that and picking up the key, this door was the entire point of that. If you've missed that key, your game ends here, there's nothing you can do, start over. Games were harsh back then. The Super Nintendo version of this game opens out into its own custom level, but that doesn't mean it's any better at all. Whilst it does look like they made a bit more of an effort with the graphics on this level, the sound and the music and the controls are just as bad as they always have been. The Sega version is so much more basic, but to me, so much more interesting as well. As you come out of the castle, you've got to pick up and use this cross that you find. This calls the gargoyle that you can give the egg to. However, it is possible to soft lock the game here though. You can actually get the cross on screen and if you walk away and get it off screen and come back, it's gone, you've lost, restart the game, there's nothing you can do. You must remember to have picked up the egg as well. If you missed the egg or you've used the egg and lost it, that's it, you can't continue. The game ends, it's not you lose a life, the game is over, start over. We did remember to pick it up though, so we can pass freely. This last run to the end of the game is really tough. I've only ever known one person who's got to this level on the Commodore Amiga. Sure, we managed to complete it with cheats and stuff back in the day, but no one ever managed to finish it. We find the last of our two items in the Sega version. The first is a bubble, and what does it do? Nothing at all. And the other item is a yellow potion. What does this do? Again, you're not going to know until you get to this point in the game. You use it and it kills you. We're ready for the last boss and you either get a guy swinging a club or kind of a dragon thing. And when we were growing up we thought, this is it, the last boss, it's a foot. <laughs> yeah, it's a giant, I guess, swinging a club. And with the Master System version here, it's so buggy, you pretty much have to use that invincibility potion. If you don't, you might just die randomly, even if nothing hits you. But I hope you did enjoy that little run through Shadow of the Beast and a few different versions and the version differences. But if you stick around, I'm going to show you one of the new versions of the game and it's the one I've always wanted to play. Back in around 2014, a small programming team called Last Dimension wanted to make an improvement to the Amiga version of the game. Releasing on Android and the PC, this was all three Shadow of the Beast games. Only the first one and the third one got completed though, unfortunately. But this release of the game makes the game mechanics so much fairer, and it's got widescreen support and it's a perfect version of the game. Almost. You see, whilst I absolutely love the Amiga music for this game, and it is absolutely iconic of the Amiga, I've always wanted to play the Amiga version with the CD soundtrack. Uh, there was Redbook audio on the FM Towns version and the TurboGrafx CD, and I'd really love to be able to play that along with the Amiga game. Thankfully, with a bit of looking around, I managed to find the CD soundtrack. And looking at the game files for Shadow of the Beast Legacy that this three game pack is called, I took a look at the sound files and how they were compressed, how they were made, how they were named, and I basically tailored the FM Town soundtrack to fit with the Amiga version. So sit back and relax, this is my full playthrough of the game I've always wanted to play. Shadow of the Beast in 4K with the FM Town soundtrack. To me, it's this game made perfection. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.
Thank you.